which is, is always good. It, it did not help me find a parking space anytime. <laughs> <time, so. laughs> uh, literally nothing helps. Nothing, nothing <laughs> helps find a parking space. And I've I got students that continue to work on uh, applications to try and find empty parking spaces. Uh, um, uh, th third we've got uh, from uh, coming to us from KPMG is Arash Azir, who I think was with uh, – did, did I get it right? Okay. Um, we, and we got a chance to meet last semester as well, so I appreciate you coming back. You're welcome. You're welcome. Hello, I'm Arash Hazer. Um, actually, I guess uh, Frank, 97, you said? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I graduated 90, 92 out of Mason, so there was only, I don't know, six or seven buildings in this, in this place, so there's a lot of changes. I do also have a 19-year-old who's in the audience here, who's a Excellent. junior here, and uh, – same thing, parking, I still had to rush here and find a parking spot. Mm -hmm. so, um, I started my, uh, actually, I, um, from a degree perspective, a little different here. I actually have a bio degree uh, in, uh, from Mason, and I also have became a PhD student in bioinformatics, computational biology informatics uh, at Mason. But because I always liked computers and IT work, I always worked on that side, so my professional work that's where I continued it and eventually just got into consulting and consulting in the region, telecom and smaller firms until I got to the big four. And I've been there for quite a while. I've been at De Deloitte, uh, you know, Bearing Point before, and now KPMG. Uh, I work in a group called CI Advisory. So what's on my work is anything that's on a CI's agenda, implementation, strategy, work, everything that's covered under IT and that is the IT um, um, Related and a CIO has that on their agenda for any corporation and or public entities, which I just October I switched actually to the federal team, so I cover the federal government now, and, um, and that's where I've been. Thank you. Uh, we also have got uh, Devin Limo from uh, Institute for Defense Analysis. Did I get the last name right? Yeah. Thanks. Um, now, if you tell me you've got a 19-year-old that's going to Mason right now, <laughs> you win by far. All right, I won't say that. All right. Uh, my name is Devin Limo. Um, I graduated from Mason in 2014, um, so I might be the youngest person on this panel, but I'm not sure. Uh, but, uh, but since graduating, um, I've been in roles of uh, business analyst, um, network administrator, systems engineer. Um, some jobs that um, some of you might be looking at um, – when you graduate uh, within this year or within the next couple years. Um, and then now I'm a system administrator um, at the Institute for Defense Analyses, which is a, uh, a DOD contractor. Um, so, uh, but yeah, so I was in your shoes a couple years ago. Um, I know what it's like to be about to graduate and looking for something or even trying to figure out what you want to look for. Um, and then right now I'm in grad school. I'm studying telecommunications um, here at Mason as well. So. Thank you, Deb. Um, and finally, we've got uh, Steve Boberski from uh, Navy Federal Credit Union. Tell me, did you get that one right? Yes, you did. Awesome. Very good. Right. Um, uh, and uh, thank you for joining us, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Steve. I did not go to Mason. I don't have kids at Mason, but if we work out a deal in three years, I could use a little help. Yeah. Um, so You're welcome. You're honorary today. Thank you. Um, so when I graduated, I... I Picked a path that, that I thought was going to be my dream job. I got a degree in statistics, and that's where I was going. And quickly, after entering the workforce, realized computers had a lot more to do with the workforce than I had been educated in, the, the work that I did done in school. And so the evolution starts. I did six years of government contracting, so I did my stance here. And then finally, I landed at Navy Federal after a couple of years away from that and, and had a number of opportunities there. Started out as a, a business analyst consultant, moved into BI development, and then took on some application development and ownership of some of our BI suites and intelligent front, front member-facing applications. And today, we are all about data and data strategy, enterprise data management, anything data. Thank you. Uh, and again, thanks to all of you for coming. I'm going to start off with the uh, first question. We've got some sample questions. I'm rephrase it just a little bit. We've mostly got, I think, mostly ISOM majors. We might have a couple of other business majors uh, in here as well. Um, 
And uh, but the first question, and for for anyone who wants to uh, tackle it first, this this ISOM major is this combination of both uh, business curriculum and uh, uh, IT curriculum, including some of the uh, strictly IT courses you would have normally seen only in the engineering school, like uh, Java programming, database uh, analysis, that kind of thing. Um, but it's this this hybrid. Uh, what kind of um, how competitive is someone coming in? If you're looking to hire, uh, just as an entry level position, what are the the the, um, the competitiveness in terms of just looking at that combination compared to other skill sets that you uh, will typically look at? How would that fit into your into your uh, hiring scheme? Anyone, please. So, so that combination, I think we, we spoke about this last semester too, is that uh, you're definitely prioritized from a KPMG perspective in our, our team. Uh, we still look at everyone who's more, the more balanced you are from an IT perspective and a business uh, perspective, the better candidate you are, at least from a consulting perspective in, 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 in a, a business consultancy advisory services. Right. Um, the, the programming side gives you a lot of the analytical, you know, how to, how to structure yourselves into thinking about programs and logic and everything else. The business side gives you a lot of how things work and what the business of IT should be. So, you, so we do certainly look at candidates who have uh, a much more balanced, either from school coursework or even from outside, we certainly look at the same. Um, and I would continue to make sure that you do have that balance because it certainly is, to me, a positive trait to have when you're looking for a job. Anyone else? Yeah, about that as well. And I think we have some similar experience because I also came out of the Big Four at, at one point. And, you know, the, the challenge you have in, in technical majors is that you know, people are very technical focused. They don't have the soft skills. You don't see very good writing skills, very good communications. Um, and I think that's that's a challenge. I mean, we we suffer from that within the industry. I mean, we have um, you know, I, the IT in general, especially working in you know inside within organizations, they they tend to struggle to cope with the business because they grew out of this you know technical world. Whether they were you know on the IT operation side, whether they're doing systems uh, systems administration or um, application development, and eventually at some point grew up through into management and became the, the, the CIO. And, and typically when they're sitting talking to either the chief financial officer or one of the business units, they have they struggle to have that, that ability to be able to communicate at that level. And I think that's one of the um, interesting things about your department and your degree is you, you, are, you know, you learn that stuff. I mean, I had a, have my degrees in computer science and I spent, uh, you know, years just programming. That was the majority of it. I did very little very, very little writing. We had to do very few presentations, and um, you know, I know coming out, uh, you know, those weren't really strong skills for me. So when I went to um, PricewaterhouseCoopers, and and you know, you really start out in a technical world. I was a, a senior associate, and eventually, if you want to continue to grow and develop, you you sort of have to develop those skills to be able to communicate, uh, to be able to do sales um, in. in consulting role and uh, things that I never thought I would be doing at the time but um, you know I think that's uh, definitely a leg up you guys have with with your degree from the School of Management because you're you're not only doing the technical side but you're also bringing those soft skills to the table which um, uh, you know is, is really good with uh, you know viewed very high with the employees I mean you definitely need that when you're working in the, in the space to continue to grow in advance so I was gonna add, uh, so I agree that the balance of the technical and the business is an imperative to getting in and being successful. I know at Navy Federal we have a number of uh, paid year-round internships, and we're looking for people to invest. It's an investment from our organization standpoint. In the future, we are hoping that m many of these, which they do, convert to full-time positions. Um, often it's not the position that they started in. The internship <coughs> is the entryway into the organization. Um, but while there, they're exposed to the business if they come into ISD or uh, and vice versa. So uh, having that blend from the start is is a lot easier to get in and get get running and be productive. Uh, anyone else want to take a look at it? I'll shift over then uh, since we're bringing up the notion of internships, which is um, the I, I know that the, uh, internships in particular are something that starts to become uh, very uh, uh, critical just in, in terms of our graduates as they're looking at it. Um, both in summer before graduation, but certainly uh, coming out. It's all about trying to establish how is that pathway from 
uh, picking up the degree uh, and walking out of uh, uh, walking out of the arena, and how do I trace the path from there to getting into the industry? Um, and so the first qu the question I've got is, what are the best pathways, and how do internships potentially play into that? Just in, from your experience, uh, both what you've been, been through and, and where you work now. I'll take it whack at it, Chris. Um, the big thing that a lot of resumes I see of people getting out of college is they have no basic work history that's relevant whatsoever. You know, Starbucks doesn't matter to me. You know, I'm sorry. I'm sure it's a tough job, but if it's not in the field and I can't relate to do you have skills that are relevant, you know, it's those are the questions I'm wondering. Has someone else sort of walked you through the path at all? Uh, I know it's tough to say I'm going to go work an internship that either doesn't pay or pays very little, but you're investing in yourself more so than you are at college because it's one of the things that I can use on a resume to check against something else and say, and actually start asking practical questions. Have you ever worked in something similar to this situation? And it really gets you a lot farther down the road for what is six months to two years of your life, depending on where you are at in college. You know, it's if someone's willing to allow you to be in their organization for any point in time and let you shadow someone or take up tasks, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong, I don't think serving them coffee either is a learning experience, but. You know, most of the internships you're going to find in this region of Northern Virginia aren't going to be that. They're not taking advantage of, you know, bad labor. They're actually there to try and teach you. They see it as, as an honor. Um, I think that anything you can do to teach yourself things outside of your degree, now that doesn't mean don't take your degree seriously, anything you can learn above and beyond is also extremely helpful because you can list that as real information, whether it's a certification or whether it's an internship or whatever it is, you know, always take advantage of those paths if they show up in your life. Anyone else got any, any sort of experience in terms of onboarding people through internships or not? So, so I'll focus on a couple of points. Uh, one thing that Trace mentioned is you, you, a lot of students look at internships as, an, as a way to get experience, to put on your resume, to get into somewhere. You got to also see it from the other side. You're being observed, right? Uh, when you're there, it's not a passive. You're just doing some things, and you're going to leave. At least from a KPMG perspective, we pay a lot of attention to the interns. Uh, we actually put interns in real-life project situations. You're not there to you know, staple papers and bring it in. You're there to crunch numbers. You're there to be part of a team, and 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 you have to do the work because we would like to see how you perform. And how do you do with, with teams with some of these skills? And, and then decide that, you know, would you be a candidate, you know, uh, you know these internships, uh, depending on where you are with your studies, you know, you might have an opportunity to get a job right there in the next semester or so on. So then you are being rated in that manner and, and remembered. So you have to keep that in mind and, 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 and work that way. The other thing is during these uh, internships, you're going to make a lot of network with people within these companies. And, and you have to see it that way, especially like with partnerships. You will meet people that, uh, you know, there might be, even though you came through a, a, uh, an internship, there might be a partner who has actually a position and they think that you're a great fit for it. And, and even if you are not selected to, to join in a specific way, that partner can make that happen for their project or something else. So you have to be cognizant that it's not just something that you like to do to gain some experience, that the company is actually doing this so that they can figure out, you know, who's the next best candidate, you know, how can they, they select. You know, this is a selection process. It's part of the selection process that we go through. Um, I can speak from the perspective of someone who, um, I, throughout college I had internships basically every summer and, and as best as I could throughout the school year as well. Um, and I would just say that the, you should really view internships as a way to get your feet wet in something that you might not end up doing when you graduate. Um, because you're really going to get some sort of experience from it, some sort of value from it, um, paid or unpaid, um, whether you find at a career fair or you network with someone that your friend knows. Um, it's important to just get your feet wet and just get in there and really dig into something. You know, if you're more into the IS or the technology side of things, really dig into whatever technology that's put in front of you and try to get some sort of level of proficiency from it or of it um, so that you can really take something from it and apply it to whatever it is next that you're going to do. Even if your internship is unpaid and only for a month and you're just 
learning about relational databases or something like that. That's what I did the summer after my freshman year because I didn't have any experience to really apply for a lot of the internships that I wanted, some of the, some of the internships that sophomores or juniors were getting. Um, so I just jumped into an unpaid thing for two months, and that's how I got to learn about relational databases so that when it came time to take my classes come the fall of my sophomore year, I was already well equipped with not only what a database was, but how to work with it and using actual real applications. Um, so I say just, you know, really get your feet wet, and, you know, it could definitely do something that um, – you will be doing once you graduate, but if not, worst case scenario is that you take something from it and apply it to whatever your next step is in the process. I think I'll um, add on to that just uh, to, to emphasize a couple of points that, that some of our uh, panelists have made. Um, when I've, I've been both on the uh, side of the desk where we're looking at hiring decisions and I've also been uh, in the room when we're evaluating applicants for the graduate program and uh, the comments that come from a supervisor who supervised that individual during an internship carry a lot of weight. Um, primarily, I mean, they're normally going to be positive to some degree because otherwise they don't tend to, you know, push those comments forward. Uh, but it, particularly in those situations where you're interning at a place and hoping for a full-time uh, offer, um, the, uh, uh, that, that first experience, that first impression uh, tends to create, you know, either a uh, someone who's ambivalent about you or someone who's really a champion on your behalf because they've seen a lot of potential. Um, I'm going to segue from that to throwing out a. Uh, I'm going to give you guys an opportunity to be especially blunt in this section because there's a thing that I know that um, a lot of my students are asking me about. If I'm going into a job, you know, how do I go about that? If I'm going into an internship with multiple interns. You know, what kind of competitive factors? And at a certain point, it starts to sound a little bit like a survivor game. And I'm thinking, I've seen some of those shows. I wouldn't hire anybody um, in there. And what it comes down to is what attitude uh, do, I tr do I adopt or what attitude do I want to uh, put forth in terms of trying to be successful at this? Uh, and it's not always the one you might think in terms of, of overconfidence or any of those other things. So I'll ask our panelists is what kind of... Um, what kind of uh, attitude or approach uh, to that entry-level position are you looking for in ter that signals to you uh, that this is someone who's a keeper? So I'll start. Um, we, Navy Federal, does not have a, an environment set up where it's competitive. There, there is no survivor game Good. going on. Um, the ones that we've hired, 10% of our team were full-time interns that have converted and, and it was just the, the maturity they displayed, the sort of the self, self initiative that they took. Um, it wasn't anything particular that anybody did, but um, it just sort of the self drive, the, the, the intent on doing something well and delivering something back to us, m more than we would expect. Yeah, I would say, I mean, it's, um, it's been about, about 10, 12 years since I've worked at an organization that had internships, but when we did, we had three, four, five at the, on at the same time, and and really, um, you know, I think to, to your point, when we were, uh, you know, it's almost like a three month interview. You're, we're, we wanted to offer them full time positions, so, um, uh, you know, but it wasn't a competitive environment by any means. We weren't looking for interns to try to compete against one another. They were all, you know, essentially competing against themselves. Like I said, it was a, it's more like a three month interview process. So. Um, you know, it's all about how, you know, the enthusiasm you come for, you know, to, to the job. And, and, you know, I think you would use the word, I think you said maturity and professionalism, and that's really what we're looking for. Uh, you know, I mean, I think in the, the time that I had was leading the, the, the business, and, you know, I probably had 15, 20 interns come through, and I think there was only one we didn't make an offer to, and that was just the one that didn't take it seriously. Uh, wanted to go hang out with his friends at night and play basketball. Didn't want to show up the next morning like everyone else, or when he did, he was tired. Um, he just stuck out from the other interns. So again, they weren't we weren't trying to compete, you know, against them. But you know, he was the only one that would show up late. He was the only one that was tired. Didn't want to do his job. So you know, just treat treat it like you know, again, treat it like it's an interview that you're you're doing. But you know, don't don't overdo it. I think if I was going to add something, there's the likability factor of someone that weighs into that. And a lot of people that are younger, and I'm going to be blunt because you said I could, Absolutely. are closed off on communication. And sometimes they're just afraid to talk and afraid to speak. And we spoke earlier about soft skills. And, you know, a lot of what the interviews and your positions are about are 
how do you communicate, whether written or verbal or, you know, and IT isn't just sitting in front of a computer and, you know, typing all day. A lot of it's trying to gather information from either your clients or from stakeholders on how you define them. Uh, so that likability factor is important as to how you present yourself. Um, true story coming out of Mason, employee number nine was, from Google was a Mason grad. I knew him really well. The only reason that I think he got the job versus 600 people he applied against was he wore a suit and he spent time talking to them, not just bragging about how well he was at coding at the time in Linux when all their back end was there. Uh, so, I mean, there's something he said of dressed and showing up for work and putting yourself out there. When I've been uh, hit up on uh, the one trait, a, couple, a few students have asked me, you know, just actually in the last couple months, walking into a job, what's the, what's the thing I need more than anything else or the thing that will make me stand out? And I think they were sort of lo looking at, is it, a, is it a coding language? Is it, you know, a ton of experience? And I, the first thing that came to mind was honesty. If you really want to stand out in IT, be the honest person. Um, and honest about what you know, honest about what you don't know, uh, honest about where things are. Um, and I think it was a little surprising to people thinking that it was going to be something much more technical than that that was going to make you more competitive. Um, but d just on, on your experience, have you, is it, has it been a thing that's been a differentiator uh, for you um, in terms of is it, is it always the person who's got the best skill set technically or anything else, or is it, uh, or is it other factors? No, uh, absolutely. I think what you said, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, recently we had someone come in with something that I hadn't seen for a long, long time, a six-page resume that they put in front of me, and, and I was one of the interviewers. And in, in one question, the six pages were debunked. What they put. So there was no honesty, and there was a lot of things that were in there that were, well, maybe he or she, I'll say, had done some things, but not that. So in, in two technical questions, it was over. So we, we said, thank you, we'll, we'll pass. That person definitely was a candidate if they had said, here's what I've done, but I'm a, I'm a fast learner. I, you know, I, I, can, I can learn this, I can do this, I can do that. And whatnot. So there, there definitely are differentiators like that. Uh, the other thing is what we gauge a lot is seriousness. It's very obvious when someone's very serious about wanting a, a new career, being professional, and, 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 co and coming in. And, and at the end of the day, there's one thing that I always use in, when I talk to someone, um, which is, um, am I comfortable putting this person in front of a client? Um, at the end of that interview, if I feel com comfortable that I can put he or she in front of a client, either in a meeting with me or themselves, that's that's all I need. I think something from, uh, you just said that reminded me. You know, when you're you're doing interviews, the one thing that always turns me off is when when you ask a question and I get the answer of we, and I'm like, well, there's only one person in the room. It's you. I you know, so I know realize you work on a lot of team projects sometimes when you're you're in college. But that I used to get that all the time. Well, we did this, we did that, we did that. I was like, I'm trying to get to what was your role, and the fact that the person really didn't have that big of a role. Um, you know, so we. You know, we we built an airplane. Well, what did you do? Well, I actually got coffee for the guy. But, you know, so you know, I'm looking for what did you do. So that's one thing to be careful when you're doing your interviews. Make sure you talk about exactly what you did. So I think I was thinking about that when you said you had this long resume that looks pretty impressive, and then you started asking. You know, you get down to what did you do, and so be very careful when you're doing your interview process. Focus on exactly what your contribution was to the project. You know, you can still describe the project overall. Make sure you describe what you did on that. I'm going to hit Devin up just real quick, quickly, which is um, piggybacking on what we're talking about. You've seen over the last uh, few years, uh, you've watched some of your peers, you know, and, and some people that have been coming in after you. What's what have you been observing in terms of what's allowing people to succeed in that job in those first couple of years, um, and or conversely, flame out uh, having been given the opportunity? Um, I definitely uh, agree along the lines of, of the soft skills, the communication. Um, I, I really liked what you said actually about, about being honest. Um, being honest about what you know and what you don't know because at the end of the day, um, you can learn technical skills. You know, you can always learn them. You can learn them for as long as you want to. But um, if you don't know how to communicate what you know or you don't know how to communicate um, or work with someone and, you know, use your proficiencies to coincide with theirs to achieve some objective, 
then it's kind of nullified what whatever technical skill that you know. Um, so I would definitely say the communication endpoint, um, just being able to 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 especially work with people, um, working groups, um, being able to not have kind of a, a win lose mentality, but but have a mentality um, that you all can work together and achieve a common objective, and you all can look good doing it. You don't have to compete with someone in your group because you think that you don't look like you know more than they do. Um, so yeah, I would definitely say communication is is what I've seen in, in my peers and and um, what I've seen so far with people I work with as well. That oh. sets them apart. Thank you. Um, two points I'll add to that. Uh, number, number one is, uh, and I'll, if, if anyone disagrees with me on this one, by all means, please disagree with me. But um, I've had some students to say, if I'm working in teams uh, in that internship or in that job, um, how do I, you know, I, I need to make sure people know what I'm doing or what I'm contributing. And, and I've said, typically, if you're on site where people are managing, your manager has a pretty good idea who's doing what. You normally don't need to push yourself. In fact, it's often better if you're, you know, uh, sharing credit uh, generously with people that deserve it um, because my experience has been management's well aware who's doing what uh, for the most part. And, and I wanted to see if you guys have, have seen that, if that's changed at all or uh, – uh, if, if there's anything that, that's untrue about that. I one. think it's something that Frank was saying, um, that uh, when we bring folks in, we're interviewing, when we're trying to test them, and it is three months of whatever, so we're, we're presenting opportunities to them, so there's no guesswork who's, who's right. doing what. We're giving them the opportunities. Go, you go off and write it. You go off and design it or whatever it is and come back. We know exactly what they're doing because we want to either weed them out or bring them on. So I think the plus side is uh, your, what you achieve is known, but this, the second piece of that is um, you're very visible, much more visible than you probably realize when you're in that setting. Um, <clears throat> you don't necessarily get a lot of feedback from your boss every day, but the people that are managing and the people that are working, um, I, I, I can tell you when, when they're meeting apart from applicants or apart from, you know, the team that's, that's looking to move up, uh, around that table of managers, everybody seems to be extremely well aware who's doing what, uh, who's not pulling their weight, and it doesn't require much back from the people. So that, that piece of that advice is just the fact that, that be aware in everything you're doing in there that you're very visible, much more than you would think. The second thing I wanted to pick up on, and, and, and I think Devin, Devin raised it as well as uh, Frank, Experience I had taking uh, Mason graduates to Taiwan last, uh, not this past January, previous January. We got a chance to visit uh, Trend Micro, um, headquartered in, actually, I think, I think they're headquartered in, in Japan or Taiwan. We were in Taiwan, and we were at their headquarters in Taiwan, and their head of security, um, which, by the way, is already spooky, because if you're the head of security at a security company, you're thinking that's going to be the worst job. And most of the time you think, who's attacking us? Uh, is it you know, our competitors or somebody else? In Taiwan, if you're a security company, the attacks are all coming pretty much from mainland China. I said, so how do you hire people with the skill sets? And she answered in a way that absolutely floored me. It was never the answer I was expecting. She said, we hire for ethics and honesty, and we will train the technical. And I thought, That's, that can't be right. You have to be coming in with some technical skill set. She said, we can teach technical. We can't teach ethics. Floored me. But as surprised as I was, I'm looking at you, and I'm not, it doesn't look like some of you guys are surprised by that answer as much as I might have been. The, uh, we teach the technical part of this all the time. I mean, I don't think there's anybody on this panel that won't say that they've taken someone they really liked and taught them everything they needed to know that was technical-wise. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but, I mean, I think you're – I think she slash you are right on with that point that you can – you can't teach the other side, but you can always – I mean, there are some people you can't teach IT to. I'm sorry. I've tried. Right. But <laughs> that is <laughs> – it true. does happen. Um, and if I can just add sure. to, your, to your previous point yeah. um, about not – necessarily putting out every or making known everything that you do or you accomplish yeah. um you shouldn't because you know the last thing you want to look like especially as a, a young professional coming to the workplace is like you're braggadocious or like you're someone that 
you, do, you don't want to give credit to someone else because you want to take all the credit. What you should be cognizant of is how you accomplish something. You know, take like when you, when you do something that you've never done before, keep in the back of your mind how you did it so that you can not only apply that the next time you, you work on something, but you can share that with the peers and your, your team that you're working with as well. So it's keeping mental note about how you accomplish something, not necessarily what it is that you can accomplish so you can brag about it. So just a quick note on that yes. real quick. Obviously, you have to also understand it's relative, right? When you come in, you also have to gauge your project lead, right? You will have all sorts of different personalities that you're going to deal with. There are some project leads who would want you to talk to them every day and tell them what you've done at the end of the day. There are some who are very hands-off. That's a learning uh, opportunity for you to learn when do I share, how do I approach and show that I'm taking care of what I need to take care of in a timely manner. So there's, there's a bit of that, too. You, it's, it's what the demand is on the other side. Uh, that's going to gauge how much you share versus communicate on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, or, or, or the level of detail. Um, and the other thing with regard to the ethics thing is certainly, I can at, at least say from a KPMG perspective, being an accounting firm, you know, ethics and, and doing the right thing are top priorities. I mean, that's what we get mandatory training on hours and hours on every year no matter what level you are. It's not the, it's not the technical training. That's, that's on you to go and figure out what you need to do. But the mandatory training is always on, if I got finished one yesterday, on how to deal with government officials and what's right to do, what's not right to do as, the, as my move to the federal team. So that's, that's a key factor in, in, in it. So if you're coming in with that kind of a ethical view of things and, and, and that's very obvious and evident, uh, you certainly have a, a big check mark next to your uh, name. So things are considered. Thank you. I'm going to throw one more sort of softball question, and then I think uh, we can open it up to some questions for the audience. This is this one you can answer either way, regardless of whether it uh, affects our ability to recruit people for our graduate program. <laughs> it's simply this: uh, How much of a deciding factor is a graduate degree when you're looking at people? That much. <laughs> so, so, probably, probably depends on the job. Yeah, yeah. so the opening is, is a big deal for us. You know, what the actual position is, we certainly make a consideration on a degree versus a non-degree or regional based on the actual opening that we have and, and sometimes the client uh, and, and the type of people we put there. But again, like personally, if I'm looking at someone, you know, there's there's a lot of people who interview, you know, goes to the the partner. If I'm one of the people who, who who's been asked to take a look at someone, I I typically I like the degree, but I like the person more. Uh, so if 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 they are the type of person, like I said, who I think would be a great addition to the team, I can take to a client. Ninety nine percent of the time, my email is. I give thumbs up to so and so. So you say yes for me. So the, the graduate degree is a nice decider sometimes, um, if everything else is equal. But there's other things like CD, CDIP, CDMP, um, different uh, groups, uh, development groups, TDWI. If the people are engaged in those, that shows the initiative just as much as some of the other factors do. And I don't think that's something we brought up before, which is just getting involved in some of those professional organizations, especially the ones that will give you opportunities to join now. It's a great way to network, but it also just shows that level of commitment because to be active in any of those organizations, um, including, you know, uh, ISACA or uh, any, any of the other ones, um, it's a time commitment. And one of the things that typically will impress folks is that you're, that you're paying with your time. Um, uh, employers know your time is valuable and they know that how you spend it shows where your priorities are. You may not necessarily have the money to pay for a lot of other things, uh, but to be able to get involved in that and, and show where you're putting your time shows that level of seriousness. Well, and the networking comes along with that. That's invaluable. Sure. I mean, oh, right. You yeah. mentioned before about the networking again, just working as an internship within the firm, but same thing with participating in these groups. There's a lot of... A lot of folks you'd want to interview, uh, you know, be able to network with, and they're going to know of job opportunities, or they may be able to, you know, 
direct you to them before they even get opened up. So you might have a leg up as a result of that. Absolutely. I mean, I was looking at this questions number nine, which was, you know, if which if you have one piece of advice that you wish they knew before you, when you were in college, you see I noted right next to it, network. That's, like for us, key. Yeah. I, uh, the more you network, and there's a lot of networking opportunities. I tell you, you can see with like KPMGs and anyone else, there's a lot of events that you can go to, and there's nothing like networking with people because um, a lot of times, I certainly, I remember people I network with. So, um, so you, you don't underestimate. And nowadays, I, I, I encourage all of you, if you don't, you should have LinkedIn accounts so that, you know, as more and more people, there's less business cards go around. Go online. You know, I have several of the students from last year or last semester who are LinkedIn connected to me now over here, and uh, that makes a big difference. You know, you can always make sure that you have that connection. Things come up. You'll know about it. Network, network, network. We'll look to see if we've got any questions from the audience at this point. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll, I'll go with a couple of others. Does anyone have a question for our panelists? Yes. I didn't like a manager I had, and I was dumb and naive and thought I can do it better, and the only way I'm going to get that chance is if I put my foot forward and try. Uh, it was not the smartest move looking back and being wiser, but I did learn a lot. Uh, I learned a lot about sales, which isn't something that's out there. Something that you guys have coming out of college that may not directly apply for a business major that we didn't have is there's tons of ways to get – consulting work that's one-off that you can work on a project that's you know there but for me it was you know I had a strong networking background providing networking and IT services was something I knew how to do um, but yeah I mean we all will have a horrible manager at some point and I had mine and that drove me to say I want to do something else and I'll spend a year to figure out whether or not this will work for me and it did Um, any other questions at this point? And while, while we uh, sort of tackle our next issue, uh, think about the things that you're looking to ask, and remember one of the best things you can do at this point is for the, for the next hour or so, you've got this professional network of these five uh, up here. So, and one of the things I have found is, is one of the most uh, beneficial aspects of having a network is the information. Information tends to be free in your network. Uh, people are happy to tell you how things are going, uh, what they've heard or what they know about. They don't always necessarily have a, a job opening or there's other things. But to just share uh, how things are right now uh, or what they know tends to be fairly free-flowing inside a network. Um, so this is, this is a good opportunity if you've got sort of those real-world questions. What I do want to um, then uh, follow up with um, – and I think, uh, I think, Azir, you had actually uh, mentioned it briefly in terms of the one piece of advice. Um, it's actually, uh, at this stage, and let's, let's get a, let's, let's pull data mine our, our crowd for just a moment. How many people are expecting that they're actually going to be graduating uh, at the end of this semester? And how many people are expecting to graduate about two semesters? And how many people, uh, probably still another year to go, at least? The rest of you. <laughs> there's, there's a big untapped resource that they're not entirely certain that they're going to graduate. Um, for those of you who are coming up this semester or next semester, if there's one piece of advice of things they need to be uh, doing in, in the months uh, that they've got left, what, what, what might that be? If, if you could go into the Wayback Machine. <laughs> And tackle this one. Uh, well, I'll, so I think one of the things that Devin said that sort of it, it, it goes back to networking, but and then once the opportunity comes around, don't be even if it's a it's not just internships but a, a permanent position, don't be so particular about the, the opportunity. The, the, you can't wait forever because the job that you think you want it, it may take a long time to get get into an organ a good organization or if you have an organization you want to get into so I'm gonna do the plug I mean we had 
1,800 promotion job changes in our organization last year alone and 3,000 external hires. So once you get in the door, there's all sorts of opportunities. And I, I don't mean just our company, anybody's company. So when there's an opportunity, take it. And it doesn't have to be exact. It should be relative, hopefully. And it's not something that's completely outside. You know, you're not do doing um, weaving, basket weaving or anything right. with your degrees. But, but something that is remotely interesting to you opens the door to all the other stuff. And then, of course, once you're in there, then starts the game of uh, let me right. show people what I can do. And the door is open. Go ahead. Well, I mentioned earlier soft skills. So one thing I would say is, you know, don't don't avoid things that make you uncomfortable. I mean, that's you know, so I, some people are uncomfortable with, you know, whether it's communication, writing. I mean, I you know, and, and I made up for it years later. I mean, I, I hated writing. I avoided it, you know, as much as possible. I was really focused on my technical classes, which were great. But then uh, there was when I got in a point where I was is managing people, and we had were producing reports for for our clients. I actually forced myself for an entire year to be the person that wrote those reports to help improve my writing skills. Um, so you know, I would say do it now while you can. You know, even though it's uncomfortable sometimes, and you may not like doing it, you're going to have to do it in your professional life. So force yourself to to you know take on that uncomfortable work and you know and get outside your comfort zone. If you do it now, it'll be much easier to take on later. Um, and if I can just add, um, in terms of the the job search or even the um, searching for an internship, um, you know, just really be diligent in how you're doing your applications. Uh, I remember for me when when I was about to graduate, I just kept a, a huge Excel sheet of every application that I put in. You know, the uh, what date I did it, who was a hiring manager, uh, when like what date I should follow up, what date I should follow up again if I didn't hear back. Um, and then you know, after a point, it kind of got discouraging because. I kind of felt, wow, this is overkill. You know, I, like this isn't going anywhere. I'm getting, you know, phone interviews here and there, but you know, I don't, I don't really know where this is going. Um, and then, thankfully, you know, one employer at the bottom of the list, I just followed up with them a week after I submitted my application, and they're like, oh, we didn't even see that you submitted it through Hire Mason. Yeah, come in for an interview. You know, so it's just uh, it, when you're looking for opportunities, um, like what they said, you know, really keep an open mind, but. Um, also, just be really diligent with it, and don't cover, like don't cut yourself out from an opportunity because you don't think it might be the best or the perfect fit for you. The double-edged sword of this yeah. is that, uh, I mean, I, I based on the hair color, um, when the internet boom was happening and everybody was could apply through the internet, people were just pumping through the things through Monster.com and whatever, and you would apply for everything. You start getting phone calls jobs that you didn't even remember applying for, and, and some of them you shouldn't have applied for. And I, I know personally I had an experience where I, had a, I applied for a CIO of a county in South Carolina and got an interview, and I had no business, very little business being there, but it was so easy to apply, and I did. So, so if you apply for a lot, which increases your odds, there's also a lot more rejection that comes with that, and there's things out there. So be mindful. We have data analyst positions uh, on our team, and we get PhD and statistics applicants have nothing to do with the data. We're not doing business analysis. We're doing data analysis. This is technical data analysis. And then we get all these overqualified folks that are like, they're clearly not even reading and going through. So yeah, it's okay to stretch, or but don't yeah, or but don't go overboard. Right. Yeah. yeah. Way, the hair is a little deceiving at only thirty-two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well. Uh, you know, I can. I want to add to that as well because I know you're you're really thinking about your first opportunity. But uh, you know, we talked about networking going forward. Uh, you know, there's just something the market goes up and down, and and there are times that no matter how good you are, no matter how much experience you have, you could be putting a resume in for a position that 15, 20, 30 other people are putting in for. And it's you know, by the time you you know, especially if you find the opportunity on a job board or or something. It, it becomes very difficult. You know, you're you're one of you know 50 resumes, and you may be near the end, and they started going through from the beginning. I missed a lot of opportunities that way. Um, you know, so when I was actually looking for my job that I had landed here, um, I same thing. I was like, I you know, I give up. I'm sick of putting resumes in. So I went out to my network, and I just started going through, sending them personal emails to let them know I was on the market. And now it's not going to happen all the time, but within two hours, I had a response back, and that's how I ended up at the Red Cross. I want to touch on something Devin said. If you have a resume, which most of you should by now, and you apply for a job, if they say things they're looking for, 
and you meet most of those things, find a way that it's on your resume and find a way even that it's at the top of your resume to make it stand out. Don't make me drill through and wonder, well, do they actually have this? Yeah, you know you've got it, but I don't know you from anybody else in this world. So take the time to customize that resume for that job. And I'm not saying rewrite it from scratch, but you know, a template can be easily modified to say, oh, they use this keyword, I have that keyword. Let me make sure I, that someone can get to it. Um, I mean, there's lots of people normally apply, but you know, you only hire one to two. Do you, do you mind if I pose a question no. to these gentlemen? No, but not at all. Uh, in your experience, what, how, how much of a factor is a cover letter to you? I don't either, a lot of times I don't see it. It goes through human resources. And, I mean, a lot of times now they're even applied online, so you don't, don't get in the resume. That brings up a good point. I mean, most most of the hiring managers probably don't even see mm -hmm. the resumes that come in often. They they everything's so automated, and HR is our, our department. We have I mean, over fourteen thousand employees. HR handles almost everything, so it goes through a screening process. So somebody's going to see it and weed out the ones right away because it takes a lot of time to interview and go through phone screens and everything. So. HR is the one that sees it, and they have a pick list of things they're looking for. If you don't meet it, you never, that applicant never came in as far as the manager. And I think that actually goes further to your point about, you know, that you know there's key words that they're looking for. If you don't have them in your resume, you said HR is going through. They don't know, I mean, they don't know what I do. They just go yeah. through and they look for key words. And if you didn't customize that resume, um, I've had candidates call me and say, you know, people I knew later and said, well, I don't understand why, why you didn't call me. And. You know, somebody I'd run into, and I found out they just their resume didn't stick out to human resources. I think um, cover. I haven't seen a cover letter for I don't know how many years, yes. but <laughs> but I think uh, to me it's it's another item that can be a double-edged sword. Right. Because if you you know they're picking on all these keywords, so if you don't craft the cover letter well, you might get disqualified right off the top. By just someone reading that and saying, you know, this writing is not really a good writing, or it's not what we uh, are looking for. Um, so you have to be cognizant of that too. But another quick comment on the soft skills uh, and the opportunity to do things between now and when you graduate. This is what I was going to say. Use your classes to develop these soft skills. Skills. You have presentations that you do in your classes. You know, don't shy away from being the one. To say, I uh, get up front and present and and do it. This is your practice time. I mean, uh, this is where you're going to be able to be comfortable in front of either your, your, you know, your fellow students and, and friends and then a, a professor who will critique it and, and so on and so forth. So work communication, this is the time to use and, and, and increase you know, your capabilities with those soft skills and, and, and do that. And then the other thing is professional associations. Look those up, join. Uh, join those associations, see where they are holding events locally and, and go to those. And uh, I'm sure there's a list of things. And from an IT perspective, there's plenty, you know, IT service management, ITSMF, you know, ITIL organizations and, and tool makers and so on to do that. And, and if I can add, just to keep on the theme of soft skills today, but um, when you're in your class, uh, another thing I'd add is, is um, like exactly like you said, you know, don't be afraid to, to be the one to stand up in front of the class. Take advantage of every opportunity you can to get that sort of experience um, while you're not, you know, uh, while your your job doesn't depend on it. Um, but also, you know, really take advantage mm -hmm. in, in networking with the students in your class, your peers. Because how many times can you say that you've gone into a classroom just to go to class, you sit down, you do your work, and you leave without talking to anyone? You know, like go in, talk to your classmates because chances are, if you're struggling with something and a problem or, or you're struggling studying for something, they're right there with you. Or you know something that they don't know or vice versa and you guys can help each other out. And you guys can stay in contact and network for the rest of your careers. I didn't start doing that until about my senior year and I wish I'd done that all four years. So uh, underlying that is, is ask questions wherever. I mean, whether it's managers, uh, this, this well, maybe you don't want to stand up and ask, but afterwards, ask questions. I get on my team about, I don't know what's going on with them if they're not asking questions of me. And so I assume they're fine. I, I host a meeting every week. Some of them are senior folks. And one of them went as far as saying, well, you know, sometimes we don't want to ask questions because we might be the only one that doesn't know the answer. And it's like, well, 
ask the question, the chances are somebody else doesn't know what's going on either. But I mean, this is 20, 30 year grizzled veteran, uh, maybe federal that is feeling that way. Um, it's not an uncommon fear, but just go ahead and ask because it gets out there and it's a lot easier to uh, help you. It helps us. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, uh, give me one second. I'm gonna, well, do those is, in my experience, um, the, the questions you ask also show what your priority is. Um, and the questions that I have found seem to get you taken the most serious in a, in a job setting or even in the academic setting. How can I be doing this better? Uh, how can I be uh, providing some more value for this organization? Um, the questions that have a tendency to um, not impress as much, how can this organization be helping me more? Uh, how can I be getting more time off? Those, those kinds of things. Um, and you'll see that the people that come up and say, um, I'd like to, you know, take on some other challenges or, or try some other stuff out, or how am I doing in terms of what I'm delivering to the company, these always tend to be treated uh, welcomely by, uh, by your managers, by anybody else. And it, it goes to your level of seriousness and it goes to your priority. The other thing that I was just going to uh, add into that was when we've, a lot of our panels have talked about that process of putting that resume in or putting that job in. Um, that application process is your first official task you're doing for that company. That's part of their process. So it's the first business process you're actually, you know, engaging in with them. And you hope it's the first one of a lot, but it could obviously wind up being the one and only business process. But they see how serious you are about that process. You'll hear people say, well, I'm not sure, you know, should I call back? Should I check in with them, see how things are going? I don't want to be a bother. Um, or maybe I should just wait for them to call me. Uh, it'll make them jealous, then they'll like me more, something. Um, it's ultimately just the thing of how serious are you. And when you see an applicant and they drop the resume in, they follow up with a call, they're very specific about uh, what, what they hope to accomplish and, and want and very specific questions, you start to think to yourself, we should hire this person because they seem to be very on top of things and we could use somebody like that. That would... Uh, especially when you got managers going, I'm struggling to handle all the details of all the things we have to do on a particular project, and this applicant seems like they're pretty on the ball in terms of, of following up in details, and that's a big plus. That application process, as I said, being your first task, is your opportunity to show your seriousness, your reliability, that kind of thing. I think another thing that didn't come up was, um, and, and I'm sure a lot of you've heard this, or well, I'm sure you heard this. Um, you know, the the internet's great, but there's also a lot of stuff on the internet. Where you know, got their Facebook's account, Twitter, and everything. Else. You know, you got to watch what you say on there and what you leave out there. I mean, I've done that, you know, many times before. Where we're interviewing for someone, and you start to go out and Google them, and you know, stuff comes up. You know, that you know, opinions on things they like to put out there, whatever. I mean, not, not say you can't do stuff like that, but you've got to watch the the tone you set. Um, uh, when you're applying for jobs, you know, if you have a, a cute little email address now or something funny name or whatever, create something different. Go to your go to Gmail or whatever. Create you know, just your name or something plain. I mean, that's, so you know, it's, those are those are things that stick out on a resume as well. But I mean, you know, they, they say that you know the stuff that sticks on the internet never goes away. But there's a lot of stuff. Just think about what you are posting out there um, that can be found because there are a lot of people that are going out and doing searches as you part part of your uh, hiring process to see what you've left on the internet. I've got a classmate, and, and I don't know how to break it to him, but he, a good third of the posts he makes on Facebook are, is criticism of his Fed client and the guy who's managing the account that he's working on as a vendor. And I'm sitting there, and it, I'm astounded uh, because I'm thinking at any moment, if if that manager finally does, you know, find that account, there's going to be no mystery. But not just that. Any other future manager says this is how this person's been approaching this job for that long. This isn't even just like an embarrassing beer photo, you know, south of the border. This is just this is day by day ripping on their client. Um, so, <laughs> if, if nothing else, don't do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you had a question.
clear one thing I would say. I mean, it, you, you know, work for the work your work for the next position that you want to be in. You know, you try to demonstrate that you're at that role. So that you know, a lot of times when I'm looking at uh, how I'm going to, you know, who's up for promotion, are they already working at that level? Now, obviously, I'm not saying you know if you're you, know, you you just start out and you're you're three years into your career and you you know you can't try to be the CIO right, but you you want to you know if you're looking at where what's the next position you want to move up, and you'd be realistic about it. I mean, I the, the people for me that get promoted are the ones that are working and demonstrating at that level. Where I end up running into problems with people is when they they uh, you know they get very upset they they didn't get promoted or they want to get promoted and and their justification is you know well the position was open why didn't you just promote me and you know from within so you know i would say look i mean look at what you should do and, and if you're at a bigger enough organization i mean this is one thing i did um then when the time when i was working at price warehouse coopers and i said well what do i need to get to the next level i looked at who the you know the the high level performers were in that role and and i saw the traits and qualities that they had and sort of that forced myself to say you know this is what i need to do to sort of emulate that so i think you should you know look at what you need to do to you know to get to that next level, not you know again, don't be you know obnoxiously aggressive about it, right? You're not bumping people off and <laughs> trying to get ahead in the organization. You're trying to uh, you know, but if you adopt those skills and you prove, show that you can work at that level, then you know you're going to get there. At Navy Federal, in addition to the annual review pr process, we have uh, individual de development plans that all managers are supposed to have with their employees, and it s sets out a three and a five year plan. And so during that, it's what you want to accomplish, where you want to go. So if we're good management, we're pushing our folks into new opportunities, um, stifling them. They're going to become less creative and less productive. So we want that. I mean, there's a reward when your employees go on to other positions and management positions and opportunities. So we're supposed to be promoting that. Um, yeah, I mean, you're not going to go entry to senior management but but there is a there is a process there's internal learning there's courses that I'm sure all of our organizations have online to develop or whatever you were just referring to about your your government classes we have online learnings um, some of those are leadership based some of them are just learning the business but all of that is part of the process and of course and then there's internal networking things that you have that, that, where you start to make relationships with some of those other managers and VPs Good point. I was I'd add to that. I promoted a lot of people over the years because they they expressed to me what their interest was, and we worked out that plan. And even to the point where I've coached people to leave the organization just because they, there wasn't going to be an opportunity for them. But I knew there was some somewhere else that they could you know immediately get promoted. And there's there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I, I you know I think that um, I you know you you can leave the organization. So like I said, if I knew of an opportunity and someone you know wasn't going to get that opportunity for another three to five, you know, three, four, five years at, at our organization, I would help them move somewhere else where they could achieve, because you're right, I mean, we do want to see people move up. And, you know. I, I, I can attest to that, by the way. You know, I, was, I was working for Frank at one point, and Frank actually did, you know, when I had opportunity to come here and teach full time, he encouraged me uh, and was supportive of it. And it's, it's a surprising thing in IT. It's not that people are going to train, you know, uh, treat you badly, but then also, you know, not let you go anywhere else. Um, remember that every individual in the IT industry is also building their own network, and it's good to have people graduate from your organization on out. Um, it, it, it strengthens your network. It strengthens the industry as a whole. It's that paradigm. is the more, uh, the more you move up in the management chain, the less work you do. But it's everybody that works for you that sort of does it. So that is for us an achievement. When we look at it, we go, yeah, I had a great year. I had three people move on to other opportunities, as long as they're not abandoning you because you're a bad manager, um, that's a good thing. Now, I, I've always taken it as a, as a sign of success as a manager when members of my team have outgrown me um, or moved on to something else internally or especially moved on uh, externally. Um, and I always took it as a sign that I wasn't doing my job as a manager if people were settled in at one spot and not really wanted to go. Um, I want to throw one more thing out there because I, I think there, one of the takeaways was what do you look for in, in terms of an applicant for leadership potential? Patience, probably. Um, there is a, a definite um, undercurrent in, amongst hiring managers uh, that are concerned that um, generationally uh, the new applicants that are coming in are very eager to think about how do they get to the end point of their career rather than focusing on that first job they're coming into. Um, there is an interesting takeaway from that. Um, if, if we have anybody from Harvard on our panel, forgive me for the next minute. Um, 
the question that was raised in one of the classes I was talking to was uh, uh, how do we compete with people with, uh, you know, more prestigious uh, university names on their degree? I said, actually, Mason is uniquely positioned. Um, when you go into a job, say you're a hiring manager and you've got two applicants in your Northern Virginia tech company. One applicant is a Mason uh, graduate. One applicant is a Harvard graduate, top grades, top in their school. And both of these are, are beginning level IT jobs. Hiring managers in Northern Virginia have a very keen sense of the fact that they will not be able to keep that prestigious uh, named graduate satisfied in that job. They're gonna come in and immediately gonna be pushing for what's the next job I can do or how do I leverage this for a job outside? And the general, the general view is, um, is this a person I really want to invest a year training them about our business if they don't really feel like they're going to commit to a year with us or certainly not anything longer? Versus a Mason grad, long-standing ties uh, to Northern Virginia, typically uh, family in the area, uh, friends. They're looking for something longer term, something where they know they can build up. They're hungry. They're all ready uh, to jump in and do the job. They tend to have been working all the way through their degree. This for a hiring manager in Northern Virginia, on balance, looks like a better investment. Looks like they're gonna get their money's worth. Looks like this is a person who's gonna stick around and become a benefit to the company. You guys feelings on that one? And again, we don't, not to slam Harvard, I'm just talking about the, the disparity and, and sort of uh, as, as uh, uh, you mentioned, just in terms of having a PhD apply for a job that doesn't require a PhD. Um, I, I tend to agree with that. We are seeing that. I think uh, recruiting leaders are, are not here, but uh, from what I understand, we this year too bumped Mason to like what's, what's considered like the platinum recruiting school, which is high priority in the area. It didn't used to be. Uh, you know, we had other schools in the area that it, we would go. The, they were preferences, you know, they were whatever the criteria are, but, but Mason is now top. We push from the inside, uh, too. You know, we have quite a lot of Mason graduates at KPMG now, and, and, and that network has grown. But, uh, yes, we certainly, from a KPMG perspective, also realize that, and I think the statistics are out there, too, that a lot of Mason graduates tend to stay in the area, uh, especially so federal teams are very interested in, in a workforce that wants to stay here and, 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 and work. Um, yes, and, and we have had Ivy League uh, hires that lasted a couple of months, two, three months, and hopped very quickly to something else that, that came along. Um, so not, not everyone, not everything, but generally I, I tend to agree, and, and we are putting a lot of emphasis on, on Mason at least. I, we haven't done it yet. We're, we're doing it anew with Mason, more work with Mason. Or with Mason. We, we've done a lot of uh, GW internships on our team. And we've, whether it was Harvard yeah. or GW, it's very transient at GW. And so one of our folks, who was phenomenal, went home for a summer, came back and said, I got a full-time job after I graduate. So she finished the year and then she went back home. And then another one, Devin and I were talking about, just the commute from D.C. Right. out to Northern Virginia for, a, for an internship is kind of tough when you have full-time school load. So um, the local's nice. Local is nice. Yeah. It is definitely a competitive advantage, and you need to be fully aware of that. Other question? Yep. Um, and, then, and then blue shirt, second, first, striped shirt. <laughs> I, If you're sorry, go on. No, no, go on, Tracy. If you're given that opportunity where that is a a spot that you can, whether it's sitting in front of them and they give you that heads up, you know, by all means, ask for any and all criticism you can get to make yourself better. Uh, if they don't want to tell you, trust me, they're not going to tell you, and they'll find all their key mechanisms to say, "I'm not going to tell you that." Uh, 
when you're at an interview, come with questions to ask yourself. It allows you your own selling points and a way to draw them out that you've thought about the job and the company. Uh, I mean, they've got questions they're asking for what they want to know about you, but if they can, if I can feel that some, someone I'm interviewing has any interest in my company and what we're doing or wants to know more information about the position, I'm going to look at them a little bit differently than just someone that's answering my questions and rolling through. So be prepared on both sides on how you ask questions. Uh, I think uh, you, you referred to information earlier. I mean, the whole thing is information exchange and you asking questions, us ask, uh, asking questions. Do your own research on the company, too. I mean, we're, we're the world's largest credit union, and people refer to us as a bank. And we get sensitive over that. We're, we're a credit union. We're not a bank. But, and there's a big difference. But um, do research on the, on the job and the company and, and just be able to go in and understand the context of what the, 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 the nature of the business is and what its charter is and whatever you can find out. Everything's online these days. Now, just a quick, that's, that's a courtesy that recruiters should extend. A lot of times they do, if you do. Now, you wouldn't reach out, if I interviewed you, I wouldn't reach out to me and say, why didn't you, did I get the job? That, to me, is unprofessional. But the recruiters who you deal with tend to usually go back with feedback. You know, sometimes it's, you know, very general things, but they should be able to say, you know, we were looking for a candidate that has more experience in, in a certain area and so on. So I don't think that's, that's you know, out of line or they, sh they tend to do that. So you, you should actually pursue that. GPA. Right. So I would say, I mean, I, I, I think it depends on who's doing the interview. Um, you know, sometimes the GPA will actually get you the interview, right? I mean, there's, I've, I've uh, seen places that will draw a line, and, you know, at a certain point, you know, they don't take anyone, you know, below a certain level. But, you know, it's, again, it's also how you, in how you interview. I mean, if you, there are people may have lower GPAs, but they, they come across great in an interview, and, and at that point, suddenly the GPA doesn't matter. I mean, if they can express to you, you know, what you want to hear, not only, you know, from, you know, their personality, but also from the, the skills that they have, then, you know, what you got in your sociology uh, elective doesn't really matter as much. Uh, but again, it, it really depends on who's doing the interview. Some people stick to it very closely, and they, they see it as a, a thing. I think it's, a, a you know, an indicator, you know, it's something you look at, but I don't, you know, I think there's other things that you, you consider as part of the interview process. Do we require it? So we have a couple of people from our HR here. Do we, rec do we look at it? Do we require, require it for internships? So it's not a huge deciding factor, apparently, but but it also raises a red flag when you have internships and sometimes you get all of these ones and, and you don't see it. So are they not showing me something, or or are they um, just not including because it's it, they're applying for a job like anybody else? I don't include. I wouldn't include it on my next uh, job application, my GPA from college. And and they usually don't ask you. Yeah, <laughs> right. Eventually, it goes, eventually it goes away. It, it, and and if you're looking at an internship, it, it, because it's close to uh, to where you're graduating, it probably carries more weight. Once you're in a job, um, pretty much you, moving from a job to another job, GPA is not going to come up again uh, typically. Um, and you know, and I think to, to Frank's point and a couple of others, if you if you've been in the industry 20 years and you're still telling people what you got in undergraduate, they're you know. Uh, they're humming glory days behind your back. Um, so <laughs> it's a, but oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. But um, if there's an anomaly in your GPA that there's an explanation for, you should feel free to bring it up. So I've had a situation like that where a person was very uh, you know, nervous about that, even though we weren't looking at GPA, and they extended that there was there's a personal issue that happened, and was it. so there was an explanation. But if it shows that, you know, four years of continued slacking and whatnot it becomes, looks like a trend, that's a flag to, to someone and says, you know, maybe this, it's not just one semester that dropped the person's GPA for a certain reason, but they continue to just not be serious about the studies. And if you think there is a good explanation, I would offer it, but, but very, I mean, I, I think... 
internships are different because I think we also have, everybody has, there's a, there's a number that they look at and they can talk. But for regular hire, uh, I don't even look at GPA at all. Yeah, and, and I'm sorry, I just wanted to add yeah, one more thing to that. Um, there are some instances on Hire Mason where you are disqualified for applying for a position, depending on your GPA, so whether it's 3.0 or 3.25. Um, just be aware of, of if, that, if that's a position that you know that you're going to want to apply for, just be aware of what that cutoff is and um, just know that. But, um, yeah, besides that, pretty much everything they said is my experience as well. It doesn't really matter that much. Um, just be aware of, of particular jobs where they do have that requirement through Hire Mason or whatever that avenue might be. Uh, one more question over here. Well, you're not going to be the lowest one that applies, I'll tell you that, at 3-2. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, it's... I, I will tell you just my, my general advice is the things you're putting in your resume uh, need to be 100% accurate, but they also should be the things that you uh, want to share, that, that you're proud of. If you're not happy with your GPA uh, and you think that that's going to become the conversation, um, then, you know, and you, and you don't think it's a selling point for you, then you leave it off. If it comes up, you address it honestly. Um, but uh, for people that have, uh, you know, an impressive GPA that shows sort of a quality indicator of the curriculum that they're also leveraging, um, it becomes something that may be a differentiator. Um, primarily, I think what employers are going to be looking at is if I'm balancing between several candidates for an internship position or an entry-level position, uh, and this shows a big differentiation, uh, it's going to matter. If it's, if it's a small difference within a pool of people, it's probably not going to be a factor. Then the other things that we've talked about already are, are going to be a much more uh, indicating factor. So that, that, I think that's sort of where you go. But, but bottom line is uh, your resume needs to always be honest and accurate, but at the same time, you're putting your best foot forward. And that's what that document was, which is why it's good advice to try and keep that down to a page, because normally a page limits you to the things you're happiest with. Yeah, especially if you're, you don't have your, your work experience, right? Right. Yeah. I've seen people coming out of college with two or three page resumes. And, and I think the other thing, have somebody read your resume. I know that I'm sure the school has, has opportunities so. for that. I, it does. The other thing is just the quality of the resume. I mean, it's just the, the formatting. Uh, I've seen resumes with typos. Uh, you know, coming out of college, you know, if you hopefully, you know, if you, you have an internship or you have some experience, but, you know, there are going to be other things that, that you want to include on your resume, but there's, you know, there's definitely things you should plan to uh, to leave off because the, the relevance of your, your interview or so. I mean, if you're involved in clubs and things like that, include that. But, you know, again, don't don't have a half page of all the clubs you participated in within your organization. That's just good. So just a, a quick tip. As an example, so that you guys have a view of the different methods, um, when I talk to a candidate, I look at their resume that they provided before, but in during the interview, I don't use it at all. I tell them to put it away. So I don't talk on the resume at all. I actually like to give them scenario. I say, let me give you a situation. You know, you're in a project, this happens, There's you have a bad manager, here's a situation. How would you handle this situation? So I actually give them a few scenarios just to see how they, they think through things, how you know their logic, you know. And, and, and that's the interview. Um, I don't go over courses because, again, courses, everybody's taking these courses. If you have, you know, I see 10 people that day, they all have the same course on. So, you know, you've done it. It doesn't make a difference. Um, it's there. You have a degree. So I know what to start off with. But the situation is a lot more important to me, and how you think and how you problem solve. I think it's a, a, an important takeaway that, that – that process, the resume, and everything else got you in front of them for the interview. From there, you want that interview to be as much about uh, you and what you what you can do for that company, what you can do going forward uh, as possible. That's where, as opposed to continuing to redo. I need to uh, say thank you to our panel um, and conclude.
concluded, make sure that we've got some time for uh, you guys to uh, uh, network a little bit. Um, and with that. Absolutely. Come on up here to the pitch area. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Eric. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Mason ISOM Association, or MISOMA. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, heard of us already, uh, we are a professionally uh, run student organization. Um, just trying to help you guys um, build a better you professionally um, so that you may <laughs> end up one day working for one of these guys or any employer that you choose. Um, uh, just one of our... Uh, Main things that we do are usually like networking events. Uh, we usually hi um, bring out uh, big and uh, small companies, um, companies like Verizon, Geico, um, Accenture, um, usually for business and IT um, positions that they may be offering and just to help you guys network. Um, we also facilitate um, interview workshops, uh, resume workshops, and also uh, academic and maybe career guidance if you want to maybe have an opinion from us or take some advice from us. Um, so that's basically all I'm here to make a pitch about. Um, if you'd like to join, come see me. I'll be in the back or I'll be uh, outside of this room. And uh, thank you. Thanks. Um, oh, please join can me. Can I just add oh, that? I'm sorry. Absolutely. I, sure. I co-signed that. If you haven't joined, they are a great resource. I was the vice president when I was in school. Um, so please join it. You guys won't be disappointed. There's a lot of networking and building soft skills like we've been talking about all day. If you, That's one avenue by which you do it when you're still a student. It's convenient while you're on campus. So. You guys can help me join, uh, thank our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.